Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, we pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at vxvchurch.com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. Well, all right. Good morning, Boiler Nation. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. That, that's not entirely true. I think there's only three of us. <laughs> Don and Janice Ray and me, that's it. But hey, uh, Purdue hasn't been in the national championship since 1969. So I thought, all right, I'm going to pay my boys their due. Let's start again. Good morning, VXV Church. This is God's house. Great to be here with you today as we are making our way verse by verse through the book of Galatians, the Bible's premier defense of the gospel of grace. It has been a power-packed couple of chapters here, has it not? And we now find ourselves this morning here in the 10th verse of the third chapter, nearing the halfway point now uh, in this incredibly profitable journey. Let's open our Bibles now to Galatians 3 and verse 10. Now, like any good narrative, you have the good guys and the bad guys, right? And of course, you have a treasure. Well, in this particular narrative, you have the good guy, the Apostle Paul, you have the bad guys, the Judaizers, and the treasure in this case are the souls of these newly minted Galatian Christians, and indeed the souls of all Christians throughout history that are the beneficiaries of this most excellent defense of the pure gospel of grace. Now, who, again, are the Judaizers? Again, we, we know the story by, well, most of us by now. They, these are the guys that had come into these four churches in the region of Galatia. That would be modern-day Turkey to you and I. And as soon as Paul and Barnabas planted those churches and were out of there, these Judaizers came up from Jerusalem pretended to have the church leadership there at the mothership behind them and deceived these new, predominantly Gentile believers into thinking they still had to be Jews to have salvation. You got Jesus, that's great, but you still have to keep the laws of Moses. You still have to keep the church rules. Now, as far as you and I are concerned, these boys, the Judaizers, the, the party of the circumcision as they were known, well, they really became the forefathers of all false teaching right on down through today that want to add human works and add human effort to the completed work of Jesus Christ on that cross that belongs to the believer by simple faith alone. Why is this need to add to what Jesus did so powerful, right? Like, like, why is legalism so powerful, in fact, that it has ensnared the likes of Peter and Barnabas and, and right on down through the rest of these 
churches. Why are none of us in this room today immune to legalism? Why is this just the natural drift of our hearts towards legalism? Like, why is that hired, hardwired in there? And the answer to that, too, is simple. It is because of our human depravity. Romans 3, it is because of our sinful tilt, our fallen bent. In short, it is because of our pride. It is a manifestation of the human ego, right? Look what we've done. Look, the the reason legalism, the reason we have this incessant need to feel like we have something to do with our salvation is because the human ego is always looking for ways to tell itself and others how good it is. Okay? If indeed God has done it all, which is the clear, undisputed contention of the scriptures, well then, where does that leave room for us in the equation of salvation? Well, it doesn't. And that is a very, very big deal to these Judaizers who are on the front end of this false teaching in the early church. And it is a very big deal today to Roman Catholics and Arminians and and, and really any system of faith that calls itself Christian, right? That relies upon human effort to somehow add to the work of our Lord Jesus Christ on that cross. So ultimately then, what are these false systems of faith asserting, and why should we have a problem with that? Well, what they are asserting is that the work of Christ on the cross, it was incomplete, okay? It was insufficient to set us free from the slave market of sin. Why should we have a massive problem with that because it is false doctrine, all right? It is bad doctrine. It therefore leads to bad practice. It is flat out dumpster fire theology from the pit of hell. It hurts and misinforms and ultimately robs the people of God of the rest and the peace and the joy that Christ has purchased for them. It is antithetical to the Gospels. It is antithetical to the Scriptures. Therefore, we do not bargain with bad doctrine. We are not to worship at the altar of tolerance. That is antichrist. Okay? We snuff it out. We kill it. We take it out back and shoot it. That is where we've been thus far, and that is something of what... The, the Apostle Paul is now in the process of doing for these six chapters here in the book of Galatians. There is nothing more important to Christendom than to affirm its central core cardinal doctrine. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, period. Everything else, and I mean everything else, it is secondary. And therefore, as I've told you before, if you will take deep into your heart the message of Galatians, it is going to bring great comfort and great peace and great rest to your soul that you might enjoy being a child of God and not religion. Now, what happened to these Galatian believers? How in the world did they fall under the spell of the Judaizers? You remember Paul said the last time we were together, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, right? Who cast a spell on you? How is it, my brothers, that you began by the spirit of grace, but now somehow you believe you're perfected by works, And of course, we all face that indictment, right? Again, none of us are insulated from legalism. Again, because it comes so naturally and it comes so instinctively to our flesh. We have to fight to see the gospel over and over again. That is our fight, lest we, like the Galatians, find ourselves somewhere down the road relating to God on the basis of our spiritual performance, our works, and not his. Now, 
if your joy, if your joy in the Lord is up and down based upon your performance, you are relating to God on the basis of your works and not his. Good news, there's a way back. Okay? There's a way back, but you have to start by understanding the drift. You have to start by recognizing the path of your departure. Why? Because the very same path in reverse is the way back to grace. You are going to have to see the gospel again. So then, now, how did this happen to the Galatians? Well, the short story is they got away from the teaching of their apostle, the apostle Paul. Okay, so by way of review then, what did we have going on in the early church? You remember it was this. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. You may also remember that Paul spent the better part of chapters 1 and 2 defending his apostleship, and this is why. They got away from the truth of the gospel. They got away from the, their apostolic teaching, which is another way of saying they got away from the word of God that came to them, all right? And now what they got away from is exactly the way back, and that is where we are here in chapter 3. Paul is now taking them back to the word of God where he is showing them in the scriptures that the plan of God has always been salvation by grace through faith. Now go back and get that study if you missed it. God had put upon Abraham his imputed righteousness. God had put his imputed righteousness upon this non-Jew, right? Literally, hundreds of years before the law ever existed, okay? The plan of God has always been we are saved by grace and not works. And so the Apostle Paul, he is in the process here in Galatians 3 of showing these disturbed, deceive, wandering Galatians that what they walked away from is what they have to walk their way back to, and that is the word of God. And now that is the very same way, brothers and sisters, uh, that is the way back to grace and peace and rest that may have eluded you as of late. It is the very same way we got to get back to the word of God, back to sound doctrine in order to see the gospel again and not religion, and then you'll have your peace. Got to see the gospel, all right? Okay, we get after it and go to work again now. Here in the third chapter of Galatians, let's get this plane up in the air. Galatians 3 and verse 10. Here we go, verse 10. For as many are of the works of the law are under a curse. Uh-oh. For it is written... This is Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26. The, actually, the last verse in Deuteronomy 27, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Wow, sounds like we're going to need grace, doesn't it? Verse 11. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, Greek obvious for, and this is Habakkuk 2.4, we saw that in chapter 2, the righteous man shall live by faith. However, verse 12, and here's the rub, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, and now we've got Leviticus 18.5, he's going all over the law of Moses here. He who practices them, what's them? The, the whole law of God shall live by them. All right. Now, if this sounds confusing to you, please know that you're not alone. All right. Like this is very Pauline Romans 7 kind of language where, where you really got to slow your roll a bit to grab this. Uh, here's John Stott 
on the passage that we have before us. He says, these verses, what you just read, uh, may seem difficult in both concept and vocabulary, yet they are fundamental to an understanding of biblical Christianity, for they concern the central issue of religion, which is how to come into a right relationship with God. Now, this difficulty that he speaks of here is going to be true of the lion's share of chapter 3, all right? And so allow me to make a bit of a preemptive strike here uh, by way of what I hope to be a few profitable remarks. Whether, whether or not you have the patience to bear with this text this morning depends in considerable measure on the way that you live your life. Okay? As John Piper might say, if you live your life on spiritual pet pills that give an immediate emotional charge or a, a specific immediate practical guidance, then you might have a hard time with today's study. However, and I believe this is the case for most of you in this room or you wouldn't be here, okay? However, if you live your life with a design to have an ever-deepening, beautiful understanding of the ways of God and Scripture, then you will savor the theology that Paul is unpacking in these verses because they are going to help you with one of the most important things that a Christian can get their brain around. And that is the relationship between the law of God and the grace of God, okay? There's this beautiful rhythm and a, a, a kind of harmonic cadence to the gospel of Jesus Christ that can only be heard deeply and heard rightly by understanding the relationship between the law of God and the grace of God. Okay, and so chapter three can get pretty heavy here. This is the Romans and Hebrews of Galatians, all right? This is the toughest sledding we have on our journey in Galatians, chapter three, all right? But if we will do the work and allow God's word to take root in our understanding, then we shall be, to paraphrase the psalmist, like sturdy trees planted by streams of living water, whose leaves do not wither, who do not get blown away by false teaching, and who keep bearing fruit while the shallow plants dry up. So we're going to have to take this slow, okay? In fact, I would submit to you that every error in Christian theology, every heresy, and every misunderstanding of the biblical gospel springs forth from a failure to understand kind of the divine dance between the law of God and the grace of God as presented in the word of God. Now, ha having said all that, Ben... Let me give you a little structural help by zooming out and getting hold of the outline here. And then I think we can get in here and do some very good things today for the well-being of your soul. So here's how this chapter is laid out. Where we've been, where we are, where we're going, all right? We're not going to get through all of this today, of course. But in verses 6 to 9 last week... Paul presented the scriptural truth out of the Old Testament that through the father of the faith, Abraham, that hundreds of years before the law ever was, right, the plan of God was to save us by faith. And so in verses 6 through 9 last week, Paul showed us what faith can do. Okay, what faith can do. Now, here in verses 10 to 12, he shows them the same thing in a different way by showing us what the law cannot do. What faith can do last week, this week, what the law cannot do. And then in verses 13 and 14, which we'll also get today, to today, how Christ in fact did what the law could not do so we could again be saved by faith. 
And so again, there's just this dance between the law and grace. Like one step leads to this next step over here that leads to that step and then back to this one over here. And when the record stops playing, you're going to have a way better feel for how this works and what a beautiful composition that the plan of God is. All right? And then finally, when we get down to verses 15 to 19, and this is trademark Pauline theology, he's going to anticipate the Judaizers' objection to what he's presenting here. Paul in his epistles is always presenting the objection because God in his foreknowledge knew what we would struggle with as well. All right. And then having done all that, he's going to spend the rest of the chapter, the best part of the chapter to tell us exactly what the law has been given for. And he's going to pull it all together in this beautiful symphony of theology that we call Galatians chapter 3. Heavy stuff, great stuff. It is always the thicker texts that yield the greatest profit for you and I. So let's roll up our sleeves and get to the music, shall we? All right. Now, again, Paul has just shown these false teachers and those who have followed them, look, God saved Abraham by faith alone. Faith saves. And so now Paul is saying, let me turn the tables, swing the conversation to the law, and show you how the law, what you believe can save you, actually cannot save. Okay? So faith saves. Let me show you. Let me cut down what you think saves that cannot. And now the first thing that he does is he imports in our first verse, verse 10, he imports into verse 10 the conclusion of Moses' discourse to the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 27. Now, the scene in chapter 27 in Deuteronomy must have been very cool. Here's what you've got. This is a picture of the Valley of Shechem today. Uh, now, Moses and the Levites, that what they did, they, pulled the, they would pull the whole nation together there in the Valley of Shechem. Josh, Joshua would duplicate this in Joshua 8. But Moses pulled the entire nation together there in the Valley of Shechem. You've got Mount Gerizim on the one side. You've got Mount Ebal on the other. And it sort of creates this natural amphitheater there in the valley. Now, the Lord tells Moses, all right, I want you to take half the children all right? I want you to take half of them and, and put them up there on Mount Ebal, and then I want you to take the other half and put them up there on Mount Gerizim, all right? And so you got Moses and the Levitical priesthood there on the valley floor, and six tribes here, six tribes there. Well, then the priests would go through every curse, all, all is the emphasis in this exercise, okay? The priest would go through all the curses in the law of Moses, after which everybody on Mount Ebal would scream in unison, amen. And then they would go through all the blessings and the people on Mount Gerizim would respond, amen. Imagine the lasting impression that that made on this fledgling nation. I mean, you got what, 2 million Jews on either side of the mountain screaming, amen. Like imagine the, the reverberation and the, 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 just the majesty of that, that exercise there in the valley. Now, after all of the curses were read... Then we would finally read this in the final verse in Deuteronomy 27. Cursed be anyone. This whole verse in the Hebrew speaks very emphatically of inclusivity. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words, plural, again, inclusive of this law by doing them. Again, notice the inclusivity. And all the people shall say, amen. Okay? Now, what is that? Well, it's exactly what Paul is quoting here in verse 10. All right? And the Jews would understand that that very last verse in Deuteronomy 27 was a summary of all the curses they just rehearsed up there on Mount Ebal. The whole focus of this giant exercise involving the entire nation was the entire law, not just parts of it, okay? All of it. And so the ethos 
Are you with me? The ethos of the ceremony was full inclusion. The emphasis is on the all, as many as, everyone, all things written, everything in the law. And that is why Paul it quotes the very last verse to draw emphatic attention to the all here. All right? You following me? Now, the Judaizers, of course, they would be focused on the to perform them peace. But now Paul shows from the word of God, and again, what would often happen between Jesus and particularly Paul was they would import one section out of an Old Testament text to pull in the entire idea, okay? And so they're they're focused on the perform them piece, but Paul shows them in the word of God that the Lord had Moses focus on the what? The all here, right? Cursed is everyone who does not that curses everyone who does not abide by what? All things written in the book of law. And now, wouldn't you know it, everyone in this room now has the Old Testament foundation and understanding of James 2.10. How about that? We're learning some things here today. What does James 2.10 say? For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point, is guilty of breaking all of it, right? And this is, of course, Paul's entire point in importing Deuteronomy 27, 26 to open our passage of this morning. Faith can save you. The law, it cannot. Why is that? Well, what are both testaments, old and new, working in harmony with one another? What is the word of God telling us about the law of God, that it's an all or nothing deal, right? It is an all or nothing deal. It's like hitting a window with a hammer at only one point and yet shattering the whole window. Are you with me? It's like the high bar jumper barely nipping the bar with his pinky toe and the whole bar coming down. That is the way God set up the law to lead you to Christ. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I can't help it. It's a beautiful plan. Read Psalm 119. Here's what we're saying. It is patently obvious. Greek day loss, okay? It is patently obvious It is absolutely evident that you and I cannot keep the entire holy standard of God 24-7, 365, right? John 1, 8 says, he who is without sin lies and the truth is not with him, right? James 3, 2 says, we all stumble in many ways. And that is the conclusion that Paul is settling the Galatians into here in verse 11. They don't have the whole New Testament. You and I do, all right? And so that is the, the, that is the, the, the uh, uh, conclusion and the theological summary that Paul is settling, trying to settle the Galatians, Galatians, uh, Galatians into here in verse 11. He is saying to them and he is saying to us, is it not patently obvious Evident that no one is justified by the law of God. And that word for evident, very emphatic, very strong, interesting. Again, day loss, it means clear, certain, obvious, manifest. In our vernacular, Paul's saying, look, it is a no-brainer here, guys. It's a no-brainer. No one could possibly ever be justified by keeping the law. The only way, the only way only way a man can be made righteous is by faith. And again, he pulls in Habakkuk 2.4. He pulls in the word of God. We saw this in chapter 2. So now, let's just backtrack just a bit here. Okay? Because I, I, I'm tempted to just wrap up all of chapter 3. Let's backtrack without, getting, uh, without my getting too far ahead of myself. Let us remember now, guys, that let's back out of the trees and take a look at the whole forest, okay? Let's remember the main point that Paul is making in Galatia, and that was ver- from verse 2, razor-sharp focus um, back here uh, in verse 2. Let's take a look at that, right? The 
This is the focus. This is the only thing I want to find out from you, Paul said, right? How about that for focus? Did you receive the Spirit of God by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Paul's got one thing on the brain. He's playing one string here in Galatia. How did you get saved? By the works of the law or by faith? And that's what Paul is trying to build out here now with this theology. How do we come to God? By the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Last week we heard about faith. This week we're going to learn about why the law doesn't work. Now, When you and I read the word law, pay attention. When we read the word law here in Galatians 3, remember that we're talking about the works of the law that's defined here, right? Why am I telling you this? Now, this is the part you got to pay attention if you want to grab Pauline theology, okay? Why am I telling you this? Here's why. When we say works of the law or when we say law in Galatians 3, listen now. What we are not talking about is the obedience of the believer that comes from faith. When we talk about works of the law or the law in the context of Galatians 3, what we're not talking about is Christian obedience that's reliant on faith. Okay, critical that you get that. We are, we are talking about, when we say works of the law, we are talking about the self-reliant efforts of men to try and earn or merit salvation, which is the opposite of faith, right? In other words, the works of the law are not the good works that the Christian does in reliance on the Holy Spirit. Are you tracking with me? Okay? That's why the works of the law are contrasted with faith and Paul's main concern for the letter, right? Like, how did you guys begin by the law, but begin by the Spirit, by faith? And are you now trying to perfect yourself? Are you going back to works? Now, the reason I want you to make the, the distinction between works of the law unto salvation and Christian obedience that flows from faith is because Paul was, listen, Paul was never saying to the Galatians, okay? He was never saying to the Galatian, Galatians, hey, hey it's bad to, to obey the law. He never said that, okay? In fact, down in verse 21, he's going to say, no, 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 may it never be. Okay, so what he is condemning here, if you're following me, is this idea of self-reliance on human effort to keep the law of God for salvation. He is saying that as an abject impossibility, you're going to need faith for that. Why? Because man cannot possibly keep all of the law, all of the time. Man is imperfect. He's going to need a savior for that. Again, I'm getting ahead of myself, hard not to, but am I making sense to anybody here? Okay. What I'm saying is it's all going to boil down to this. Thank you for paying attention. That's why I love pastoring this group of believers. So what I'm saying now, and the distinction is this, okay? Now you're going to get Galatians 3. The problem with the Judaizers is not that they're trying to do and obey the law of God, okay? The problem is their failure to understand that apart from faith in Christ, the sinless law keeper who kept it all for us, right? Apart from faith in Christ, their efforts for self, for their effort to keep the law is ferociously futile for salvation, okay? What is that? What are these guys doing? Like, like what is that, depending on the law for salvation? What, what, what is that? It is nothing more than zeal without knowledge. With me? Zeal without knowledge. In Hosea 4, 6, we said last week, my people are destroyed for what? A lack of knowledge. Here's Paul lending a hand to us in the book of Romans chapter 10 about these very same guys. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with 
knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the imputed righteousness of God. For, for Christ. Now, here's the theology. Get with me. This is beautiful. Honey on your tongue, all right? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Now, that's not the end of the law for sanctification, is it? No, no, no. It's the end of the law for what? Righteousness. In other words, as Christians, we're not done with the law. All right, we're, we're not done with Christian obedience that comes from faith, right? What, what, what are we done with? We're done with the works of the law as a means of salvation. Because like Abraham, we have the imputed righteousness of Christ. Christ is the end of the law for salvation, for righteousness, for everyone who believes. Are you still tracking with me? Okay. Now, what has Paul done for us. He has pulled it all together for us. He has given us knowledge. What is that knowledge? It is this. Let's pull it all together, okay? There is a difference. Stay with me. There is a difference between relying upon the works of the law as a means for salvation Clear? Let's keep this in our head. There is a difference between the works of the law and relying salvation for salvation and Christian obedience that relies upon faith. That's what I want to make sure you see. There is a difference between the works of the law as a means for salvation, totally different from Christian obedience that relies on faith. I'm really wanting to slow down and make sure you get that. Here's another way to help you with that. Christian obedience doesn't have to uh, obey. Christian obedience doesn't have to obey for salvation. It wants to behave because of salvation. doesn't have to for salvation. It wants to because of salvation as what Jesus has done for you looms ever increasingly large in your heart. Okay? Because as we've discovered, you blow the tiniest point in the law, you have failed it all as a means of righteousness because the only righteousness that God accepts is the sinless, perfect righteousness of Christ, which he gives you on that cross. It's all yours for the taking as you believe and trust that his work was sufficient and that you do not have to add to it to be saved. Are we there yet? I know that's a lot, man. I know that's a lot. But this is so good to get for your soul because it's going to help you really see the gospel. Now, could I have given you that summary uh, way up front? Sure. But it makes a lot more sense as you build it out patiently, doesn't it? And that's the genius of the Apostle Paul and the genius of his God who inspired him. I could have given you this summary up front, but it's not, you're not going to learn. It's not going to make sense as much as if you build it out patiently. Listen, the only theology that sticks, the only theology that sticks is the theology that you build up and reason through, not the spoon-fed brand that's, that's in your brain, and then 20 minutes later, it's out of it. Okay, that's not going to stick. That is why the Lord says to us through the prophet Isaiah, come let us 
reason together, Isaiah 118. And so we have followed the train of the apostle Paul's thoughts here. And now as we have done so, we can now make an observation or two here that are very important to grab the apostle's argument. Listen very carefully. Here's where it all comes to a head. All right. Listen carefully and you will get to where Paul has arrived here in Galatians chapter 3. The advice of the Judaizers to supplement faith with the works of the law had exactly the opposite effect from the one intended. It brought a curse and not a blessing. Let me say that again because this is Galatians 3. Okay? The advice of these Judaizers to supplement faith with the works of the law had exactly the opposite effect from the one intended and that it did not bring a blessing. It brought a curse. Now, there are profound implications for you and I today, and perhaps now you're going to begin to understand why we do not bargain with bad doctrine. Here's how important this is, okay? Here's how important this is. Don't take this text lightly. Do you remember chapter 1? Paul said what? And he said it twice. But even if we or an angel from heaven, no matter what person comes to you, that, that's hyperbole, okay? I don't care who comes to you. I don't care if they're sprouting wings, okay? That's hyperbole. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. This is right out of the blocks in the first 10 verses. And he felt the need to say it again, as we have said before. So I say again, now, if a man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you had received, he is to be accursed. What does that word for accursed mean? Again, damnation, destruction, cursed. So when Paul says here in verse 10 again, Right? So when Paul verse says in 10 there, as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, we need to take this text with the appropriate weight that is being laid out here. Listen, Paul is talking about the divine blessing and the divine curse here in Galatians. Okay? It is the blessing and the curse that are being contrasted. And now, really listen. Okay? Really listen, the continental divide here in Galatians, understand this is not between church people and non-church people, all right? It is between those, it's not between those who call Jesus Lord and those who do not, all right? It is between those who have been crucified with Christ and are living on continual reliance on the work of Christ and the Spirit of God and those who never really died to self-reliance and self-effort, who believe and behave as if religion is nothing more than an exercise in moral reformation. This isn't church people and non-church people. This is among professing Christians. There are those that are utterly dependent on the Spirit of God for breath and life and even your next heartbeat. And then there are those who have never really died to self. Jesus is sort of something on the side. They don't look at their Bibles between Sundays. Religion is an exercise in self-reformation. I should probably get my kids there. Moral reformation, moral therapeutic deism. That's why we don't teach behavior to you here. We teach you the glory of God. Listen, Galatians is here to remind all of us in this room of the unspeakable danger of false assurance. Okay, using God talk and praying at meals and avoiding gross sin does not put us under God's blessing. The Judaizers are doing all of those things and they are under God's curse. 
What puts you under the blessing of Abraham, brothers and sisters, what, what puts God's imputed righteousness is trusting only in his work on that cross and not our own at all. Not our own to begin, not our own in the middle, not our own in the end. You did not choose me. I chose you, John 15. And he chose you before the planet was here, Ephesians 1. From regeneration to faith to the slow work of grace all the way to glory, salvation is all of God and nothing of man, period. Or it's bad doctrine. And it hurts you and prevents you from resting because you could never possibly get it all done. And you're going to be tired and cranky and end, ending up judging everybody else because you think you're judged. From regeneration to faith to the slow work of grace to glory, it is all of God. He's going to pull you down those tracks. It's not a ladder going upwards. It's going that way. And faith is what's coupling you to the engine car, who is the Lord. Stay with him, and he's going to bring you to glory. It's that simple. If you're on board with that, if you are on board with all God and nothing of man, you are under the irrevocable blessing of God. It is irrevocable. And so the way to hear Galatians 3 is in a sober spirit of self-evaluation and self-examination. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourself to see whether you are standing in faith, growing in the Lord, or you're the same person today that you were 10 years ago and maybe worse. Examine yourself to see if you are in the faith or relying upon your self-effort or you just don't really care that much. We do not bargain with bad doctrine, VXV. There's way too much at stake. As I've told you before, false assurance has sent more people to hell than sex, drugs, and rock and roll combined. Now then, now that we've reasoned, now that we've digested knowledge that matures, now that we have an understanding, a deeper understanding of theology that sticks, we can move now to the following summary transition here. The word of God, my beloved, it gives you essentially two options, all right? Well, one of which is not really an option, uh, and it shows you every 20 minutes. But, but it, it, however... We may deduce from what we have just studied that the word of God gives you two options. One of them is you have to keep the entire law of God perfectly. Okay? That is the option given in verse 12 there. He who practices them shall live by them. This is Paul quoting Leviticus 18.5 to say this. If you are relying on the works of the law for your salvation, then you're going to have to live by them perfectly. Which, as you may remember, was a point that Jesus made rather poignantly in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, Be ye perfect. As your father in heaven is perfect. The marvelous truth of the gospel there was Christ would meet that perfect standard on your behalf. Okay? And that's option number two. So you either keep the law and you got to keep it perfectly or you got option two, Christ. Now, you want to go the law of Moses route. I, I do not advise that route. But if you want to go that route, well, good luck with that, right? Because your thought life has already busted that standard at least a dozen times here in this room this morning, probably more than that. Okay, you go that route, brothers and sisters, you are putting yourself under the curse. Depart from me, I never knew you. Oh, but Lord, Lord, we said Lord, Lord, I don't care, I never knew you. No, bye-bye. So you go that route, you can go that route, but man, you go that route, you're putting yourself under the curse. Or you can go the route of the cursed one who became the curse 
for you. Finally, this morning, we read of the good route. Now, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Here it is, gang. Having become a curse for us, for it is written. Just notice how Paul just keeps going back to the word of God, back to the word of God, back to the word of God, back to the word of God. Something you will never hear in the seeker-sensitive stream or the charismatic stream. Paul is grounding everything in exegesis. Watch this. Having become a curse for us, for it is written. In other words, let me show you in the Bible. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's Deuteronomy 21. That is a reference to the cross. Why the cross? Verse 14. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we, you and I, would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That right there is a lot of theology there. Very rich text, okay? So Paul now, looking through the window of the law now that he's just debunked as a means, you can see through it to Christ, but debunking it as a means, oh, we got to polish the law, give me the Windex, I've got to keep this looking perfect. No, 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 you got to look through it to Christ, okay? So looking through the window of the law, we can see the solution to our sin dilemma in the person and works of Jesus Christ who became on that cross the curse of the law in our place. You cannot do it. I cannot do it. We are not sinless. We are not God. But Jesus is sinless. Jesus is God. And he is the only one and therefore the only possible solution to the Father. He said in John 14, there is no way to the Father but through me. Okay? John 14, 6. And that is what Paul is resolving his argument with here. The cross of Christ is truly the only option for mankind, and there are no others. And so let us begin to exegete this text with a clear reference to the cross there in verse uh, 16. Now again, he's quoting Deuteronomy 21, 23 there, and what that means is, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. It it was um, Hebraic custom there in ancient Judaism to hang the body of a convicted criminal on a post or a tree, okay? Uh, After that they had been executed, and that typically by stoning. Right, And the idea in the law of God there was that, that that person that hung from that tree, their body would remain there until sunset as a visible representation that they had been rejected by God. Okay? Now, important distinction here, Bible students. That body was not cursed because of the tree but rather they were hung on that tree because they had become accursed. Understand the difference? And that is the picture of the cross. You see, Jesus did not become a curse on the wood. He did not become a curse because he was crucified, but Jesus was crucified because he had become a curse in our place. Okay? You see, Jesus being judged for our sin, Jesus what? He became the curse for us. John MacArthur says those two words, for us, they become the most two beautiful words in all of Scripture because God sent his son to bear the penalty for our sin, to bear the curse for us. What are we saying? Whoever puts their trust in Christ has had their curse born for them by him. You put your trust in Christ, brother and sister. Ah, what a comforting thought that there is never going to be any punishment marching in your direction because Christ bore it all, okay? And this is why Peter says, notice here, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. There's your tie to Deuteronomy, right? That we might die to sin and live 
to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Healed of what? The insidious, infectious disease of sin. And now you have the theology of the cross as rooted in the Old Testament. And so now Paul can say, Christ redeemed us so that in Christ Jesus there, right? The blessing promised to Abraham before the law, right? So that in order, Christ redeemed us in order that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that the blessing and not the curse might come to you and me. Do you know the curse? Uh, John talks about it in Revelation as he sees the dead being cast into the lake of fire. Cast into the lake of fire. Jesus speaks about this curse, and he always talks about it like this. Outer darkness. Lake of fire, outer darkness. Under the curse, in hell, there is a fire burn that burns that gives off no light. Now, a fire that burns should give off light, right? No, no, no. There is a fire that's going to burn and consume, but gives off no light. I can't even begin to put into human English what the curse might look like for those that don't place their trust in Christ and think they can have heaven by perfection. It's insidious. And it's dumb. Christ redeemed us So that the blessing of Abraham, what's the blessing of Abraham? The promise of faith might come to the Gentiles. Now, this word for redeemed here is very interesting. And that ought to afford you and I yet more additional cover. Man, we're stacking pillows here this morning, all right? That word for redeemed there is exagorazo. It sounds like an Italian soup, right? Exagorazo, but but it's actually Greek, and it means to purchase fully, all right? It means to buy up. It means to buy out. It means to pay a ransom. This is a, exorazo is a transactional term, okay? A transaction has taken place. Now, listen, that cannot be reversed. And so there's, there's really great Reformed theology in exagorazo. They, they would use this word most often in classical Greek to speak of a slave that had been purchased out of the, the slave market, okay? Once your debt was paid as a slave, once you were redeemed, exagorazo, you're, you're free for life. Your, your servitude is over. Right Now, in like manner, Paul is saying, that is what the cross did for you. God the Father took that payment from the Son, right? And then remember, what did the resurrection tell us last week? That the check cleared, right? That the payment took you. Your imprisonment and sin is over. So why do you still play with it? Why do I? Because we're dumb. Your imprisonment is over, which means you will never, ever have to be purchased out of the slave market again, which means, friends, the ultimate security. You can never lose the salvation that's been purchased for you. That that price will never have to be paid again. Do, Do you understand that? What is that? Knowledge without which my people are destroyed, right? And without that knowledge, without that security, you're just going to be one of those insecure believers that thinks you got to circle back to the altar again and again, trying to get saved over. Oh man, God's going to go broke paying this ransom for me, right? No, no, he paid it once, Romans 6. He died for sin once. Once, Nate. Once for all. All right, now, finally here, the Apostle Paul rounds off his argument with four very important words, a very, four very important theological summary facts 
that just continue to pad the comfort here in the word of God. We are stacking pillows in Galatians 3. This is laden with doctrinal content. What are those four words? They are receive, promise, spirit, and faith. Let's take them each in turn, and we'll see if we can't pull this text together in a way that's both comforting, but sounds the bell of conviction for those without hope, okay? All right. So, Christ became the curse for us, right? Christ became the curse so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, that first word there is receive, What we need to be reminded of here is that we have received the promised blessing, right? It it is something that has been given to us. It is a gift. A gift does not ask for reciprocation. A gift is not something you have to pay off over time by works. God is a debtor to no one, right? It's a gift, A gift is something that comes to you by the giver's benevolence and seeks nothing in return. And yet you strive in the energies of the flesh to somehow earn his favor. No, that is the debtor's ethic. It's a gift. It's unilateral. Sometimes you hear this idea from pastors I've heard it. I don't know if you have. Hey, hey, God has done all these things for you. You can at least do these things for him. No, no, no. That is the debtor's ethic. That is begrudging submission. God does not need anything from you and I. The promised blessing is a gift to be enjoyed that you might delight in the giver of the gift. It is the gift of God. The begrudging submission of the debtor's ethic. Well, you did this for me, so I better pay that. That does not glorify God. That is a false view of justification that Paul is here defending. We have received a precious gift. Number two, our salvation is a promise. It's not a novelty. Now, maybe some of our promises are a bit empty, right? This is a promise from God, all right? This is a promise of God, and God does not lie. There is no shadow of turning in him, James 1, right? God God is a truth teller, okay? God is a truth teller. He is full of grace and truth, John 1. He is the way and the truth in the life, John 14. The spirit of truth, John 15. The Bible says his word is truth, John 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The sum of his word is truth, 119. He is called faithful and true, Revelation 19. He is a truth teller, all right? What are we saying? This, if it is God who is the author of the promise, man, you can take that truth to the bank. It's over. Here's Paul in the promise in Romans chapter 8. You've seen this. He speaks of the promise in past tense. All right. For those whom he foreknew, all of you that named the name in Christ in this room, little over half of you, All right. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. He blazed a trail for you. Talked about that last week, right? And these whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified, Galatians 3. And those whom he justified, he will also glorify. He glorified Okay, all of those verbs are conjugated in the aorist active indicative. That that means, aorist tense means it's a past tense event in the eternal realm. What are you saying, Pastor, this? In the mind of God, it's already done. Okay, in the mind of God, the Bible is saying it is 
done. You and I were, were created in this sub-reality, governed by time and space, that God is redeeming us out of and into his timeless reality. All right? It is done right? You and I are simply passing through space and time, being prepared for glory in this already established reality in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. It's a promise. It is finished. Rejoice. The third word there, this promise is of the Spirit. Now, what a comforting thought that the believer is not left to his or her own devices on the journey to glory, but that God has given us his spirit. You're not alone on this journey. Well, who was justified, who was called, was justified, who was justified, is glorified. Here's how, by that self-same spirit, okay? You're not left on, on your own to get to glory, guys. You're not left to your own devices on this journey. God has given you his spirit. Who is called in the Bible what? The spirit of truth, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge to teach us, guide us, lead us. John 15, right? He is our comforter, counselor, advocate, power, strength. We are never on our own. Jesus was Emmanuel, God, with us. The Holy Spirit, VXV, is God in us. What a striking reality to lay hold of, friends, that the very self-same Spirit of God that bore witness to Abraham 430 years before the law ever was, now that same Spirit dwells in you, bearing witness by the Word of God, the very same thing to you that you, 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 all of us are made right by faith and not works. Galatians is going to make sure you know this, isn't it? And now that is the fourth and final word here, faith. How fitting. Reminding us yet again and again and again, repetition is the mother of learning because we have stiff necks and stubborn hearts. So God has to keep telling us, you know, like what, we are, what our little kids are to us, we are to our Heavenly Father. That's the object lesson in having young children. And that has really helped my wife and I because when we get through these things with these kids, we're like, we're doing this every day with him. Are we not? We cannot earn our salvation by the sweat of our brow nor the work of our hands, but we are coupled to the saving and sanctifying power of God by faith alone and not works. What a fitting way, as I said, for the apostle to resolve this argument punctuated here this morning with the very point of the epistle to the Galatians that we are saved by grace alone through simple faith alone in the one who bore that curse for you and I. Let's land the plane for today. This mustache is driving me nuts. <laughs> this is a serious chapter. This is a serious book. This teaching was not propagated by secular, humanist, and atheist, and agnostic outsiders. This message came forward because a number of professing Christians from Jerusalem were trying to serve God in a way that diminishes his glory and his grace by elevating and cultivating their own pride in religious performance. Hear this. The degree to which you are elevating works in salvation, that is the degree to which you are making little of the glory of God. Let me say that one again. The degree to which you are elevating works and salvation, 
is the degree to which you are making little of the glory of God. You need to know that. And it is here in chapter 3, and we have ways to go, that Paul sets forth, and we've got a foundation, we've got a lot of work to do, but it's here that Paul sets forth the proper understanding, and we're going to develop this more, and you are going to get this gospel. Paul sets forth the proper understanding of the relationship between law and grace that is necessary to nurture a Christ-exalting, God-honoring, saving understanding of the gospel. And so you've got the double-edged sword of the word of God here, don't you? I believe Paul intends to scare the hell out of those who are relying on false profession. I mean, literally, more than figuratively, he wants to scare the hell out of you so that there is no hell left in you. I believe he wants to scare the hell out of those who are holding to false profession, literally. False profession should not be something that would survive long in a church that's faithful to teach the uncompromised word of God. On the other hand, for those of us who are holy and completely reliant upon the grace of God, for those of us who have put self-reliance to death, not perfectly in practice, but for those of us who have put self-reliance to death, at least in our own hearts, if, if the dominant flow of our hearts and our brains is glad-hearted and perfectly executed in obedience and reliance upon the Spirit of God, there is no book in all all of the Bible that brings forth more rest and more comfort and more peace than Paul's epistle to the Galatians. There is no more theologically robust, rich, strenuous defense of the salvation of grace, the grace of God by faith alone found anywhere in the Bible. And that is good news for you and I, the best news. Paul is presenting to the Galatians and he is presenting to you and I today, look, you got two choices here, okay? You can keep the law of God perfectly. Good luck with that. You're placing yourself under the curse. Or you can put all of your trust in the one who bore that curse for you. What Paul was telling us here, well, whether consulting Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Habakkuk, the message is the same. Perfection allows no exceptions. No failure of the smallest kind. To break the pristine, clear glass of the law at one tiny point is to shatter the whole pain. And so it is for those who are trying to come to God by their own perfection. You're already broken before you start. The law, it's all about doing, right? Faith is not concerned about doing for salvation. It's concerned about doing for love. The law. It's all about pointing to self and elevating self. Hey, look how good and how, or, or look how much I can do. No, you're not so hot, but boy, look at me, man. That, that's pagan. Faith says, man, I don't have to carry that. Jesus did it all. I cannot add to it but I can rely on his spirit and his power and his grace and his mercy to get me down the tracks as I'm fumbling and stumbling my way to glory. I don't have to measure up because he did. I don't have to be better. I want to be better. Because, man, I love him and I worship him. I'm in awe of him. I cannot even begin to get my arms and my tiny, finite little brain around his infinite excellence and truth and beauty and worth and value in the universe. He has given me better affections. He has given me a better gift. He has given me himself. God has saved you by grace. 
God has saved you by grace, and he is going to bring you to a completed end by grace. And at the end of it all, if every one of you will trust him, not half of you, not 60% of you, if every one of you will trust him, every single one of you will miss the curse. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it is my deepest desire for every soul in this room to miss the curse. It is my deepest desire that we would learn of your infinite excellence and beauty and majesty, your regality, your supremacy. God, you are so good, human words fail. We're so small, you're so vast, and yet you made yourself small enough for us to understand in the person of Jesus who bore the curse for us that we could miss it. But Lord, we sure do think we're something. We sure do think we can do this, do that, do the other thing. We sure have been raised in a culture that, that taught us to elevate ourselves. God, I pray you would just continue to rewire our hearts and in so doing, Free us to delight in you. Free us from the bondage of religion that makes us miserable. Free us to just go and live and love and learn of your profound, fathomless beauty and love. Redirect our affections, God, this week, I pray. Thank you for this message. And I know we're not done. Begin to sow your word. May it penetrate deeply into our hearts that we may flourish as your children and bring you by that flourishing glory that is due to you. All honor and glory is due to you. We ask these things in the precious name of our Savior who bore that curse, Jesus Christ. And the people of God said, amen. Amen. Let's worship.